Automatic disconnection of supply is a protective measure in which basic protection is provided by basic insulation of live parts or by barriers or enclosures. And fault protection is provided by protective earthing, equipotential bonding and automatic disconnection in case of a fault using a suitable circuit protective device. Dave, it means that the designer of the circuit should have taken into account that in the event of a fault, the protective device will operate and thus disconnect the supply automatically. Now we've already discussed basic protection, but what can you tell us about fault protection provided by protective earthing? Protective earthing is incredibly important and is essential due to the way the electrical supply system in the UK operates. Very basically, the most common forms of supply are based on TN systems, where the supply neutral and earth are derived from the star point of the transformer and connected to one or more earth electrodes in the ground, usually adjacent to the generator or local transformer. This was introduced when the national grid was first formed, so that all of the generating stations around the UK could use the mass of earth as the most effective reference point for all their supplies, making it much easier to sync them together. Unfortunately, this means that electricity, in its drive to return to the source of supply, will happily flow through us if we're touching anything live and in connection with Earth at the same time. So to protect against this, ADS requires all exposed and extraneous conductive parts in an installation to be connected to Earth, and also that the current return path to the common point at the source of supply be of as low impedance as possible, so that the current flow under fault conditions will be sufficient to cause the protective device to automatically disconnect the supply. TN systems often provide a low impedance path for earth fault currents by adopting either the existing supply neutral conductor in a TNCS system or a separate protective conductor such as the metallic sheath of an armoured cable in a TNS system. For this to work as a complete protective system, all extraneous and exposed conductive parts within the installation must be connected to the external earthing arrangement. They will then be regarded as being at the same electrical potential as Earth. The conductors within the installation providing this connection to Earth are known collectively as protective conductors. There's an earthing conductor, which connects between the incoming supply Earth, which could be an Earth electrode on a TT system, and the main earthing terminal, or MET. All exposed conductive parts in the installation are connected to the MET using circuit protective conductors. CPCs. It's a requirement for CPCs to be run to and terminated at each point and accessory such as switches, ceiling roses and socket outlets. Main protective bonding conductors connect extraneous conductive parts such as gas and water pipes to the main earthing terminal. Another protective conductor you might encounter is a supplementary protective bonding conductor. We will examine these later under the topic of additional protection. All protective conductors must be suitably sized, in accordance with Chapter 5.4 of the regs, so they can safely carry the expected level of fault current until the fault is cleared. So any fault of negligible impedance between line and earth will travel via the installation protective conductors, out of the building and make its way to the star point back at the generator or transformer. In an actual earth installation during a fault, there could also be some fault current returning to the source of the supply via parallel earth paths, for example through extraneous conductive parts and the general mass of earth. It's also worth noting that if I were touching exposed or extraneous conductive parts during an earth fault condition, any current that would flow through me to earth would be of very low magnitude, as the majority of the current would be flowing through the pipework and the protective conductors, which have a much lower resistance than me. The path that earth fault current takes back to the source of supply, whether through pipework and protective conductors, or even the earth itself, is known as the earth fault loop, and its impedance, ZS, is measured in ohms. So when electrical installations are designed, it's important to keep the value of ZS low enough to ensure that sufficient current flows thus causing the circuit protective device to operate within the required disconnection time.
There are tables in the regulations which list maximum ZS values for different types of circuit protective devices. And these have been determined from the time current characteristics graphs in Appendix 3 of the regs. We'll look at these in detail in other videos in this series. It's important to point out that the portion of the earth fault loop path external to the installation is known as ZE. Electricity distributors declare values for ZE on a TNCS system to be 0.35 of an ohm and on a TNS system to be 0.8 of an ohm. So the principle of automatic disconnection of supply is that using Ohm's law, the low impedance path to earth means that earth fault currents should be of high magnitude so making them easier for the circuit protective device to distinguish against overloads and disconnect the supply quickly. The wiring regulations provide maximum disconnection times for all circuit types. This table covers final circuits, not exceeding 32 amps. For two 30 volt supplies, the protective device must disconnect the supply to the line conductor within 0.4 seconds on a TN system and 0.2 of a second on a TT system. However, there is a note below which does allow the same disconnection time as a TN system where disconnection is achieved by an overcurrent device and protective equipotential bonding is connected to all extraneous conductive parts in the installation. For circuits rated at above 32 amps or distribution circuits, the regs do permit an increased disconnection time of 5 seconds on a TN and 1 second on a TT. With a TT system, part of the earth return path back to the generator or transformer is not provided by a dedicated conductor, but actually through the mass of earth itself. The resistance of an earth electrode, RA, is likely to be much higher than the value of ZE we discussed earlier for a TN system. In fact, the regulations only recommend that the resistance of an earth electrode be as low as practical and that a value exceeding 200 ohms may not be stable. So on a TT system, earth fault currents aren't always going to be of high magnitude, which may mean that the maximum disconnection times may not be achievable using protective devices such as fuses or circuit breakers. We should just clarify that short circuit currents, such as those flowing between line and neutral, should be, by design, of sufficient magnitude to operate the overcurrent protective device for that circuit within the required time, whether the supply is TN or TT. Dave mentioned the term overcurrent device. These are devices, such as fuses or circuit breakers, which we'll introduce later. Another device is required when we examine the requirements for additional protection against electric shock. Before we move on to that though, Tony, can we just do a quick recap? Let's imagine the flex to an immersion heater is worn through and the line conductor touches the casing. What actually happens? With effective ADS in place, an earth fault current or an overcurrent will flow very quickly to earth, causing the fuse or the circuit breaker to disconnect the circuit within 0.4 of a second. So even if you went to touch it, it will be dead before you did. OK, so why on earth, pardon the pun, is there a requirement for additional protection? Well, we'll investigate that in the next section.